have this thought uh, about Nick Calatis. Like we we've talked a lot about free throws, and and we had one separate topic about free throw routines, uh, shooting percentages, and I was just thinking one night. Is there any sense for for uh, the opposing team, like when it's a close game, you have two or three minutes left, you're playing Fenerbahce, to just do a hack a nick, like nobody's doing it in Europe, why not? M Monaco tried to do hack and nick uh, in the last possessions of the game of Fenerbahce, but I think that somebody missed that situation and Nick passed the ball, so he avoided okay. hack situation. I mean, it's like even in the middle of the fourth quarter, for example. Like, but if, this is a great. If you take hack a shack, it's been used like in the third quarter when the team is down by 15 and they want to stop the Los Angeles Lakers doing a run, they go hack a shack. Uh, and in this case, I'm just talking about the fourth quarter, like you're down by five. So you hack a nick, and then Itudis either lives with Kaleidis shooting free throws, being a 40% free throw shooter, or he takes you take out. the best passer in Europe out of the game. So I'm I'm not sure why nobody's doing it. I don't know if what I'm saying makes any sense to you guys. I think that I Alba. I don't know if they're playing Alba, <laughs> but they are tend to do some the things team, like that. The team that is most likely yeah. to have but some Alba uh, these day, days doesn't get close in the fourth quarter. That's, that's probably also the point. true. Yeah, I mean Nick is only eight of twenty-two. So exactly which is thirty-six like, percent free throw shooting. If I'm fouling him. Of course, I need to be in the bonus, and I probably wouldn't want my key players taking personal fouls. And I need to uh, have a guy for 11, that 12. for that mission, for example, to to just do hack and nick. And if I do it like three possessions in a row, and he makes like one out of six, or like even two, even or two three out of six, six, that's huge. So that's a huge change in the in the momentum. And Itudis then has to make a decision: Does he want to live with this? Does he want to take the best passer in the game? Out of the court, not only the best passer, you know, great defender, exactly, team, you know, guy who orchestrates the offense, exactly. So, I hope just I hope teams are listening. <laughs> How they just played Alba, actually. So, and I know if one team will do it and it will be successful, then Fenerbahce will be prepared for this. Mm. Nikolaitis would be prepared for this mentally, and for the others, it would be difficult to do it as successfully, but. At least once, somebody or for the playoffs, for for instance, to make that yeah, kind no, of it's just, that yeah, it's huge. just I think in Europe it's a lot of um, pieces that ha that you have you have to uh, play the eleventh or twelfth guy. You have to let him in, so he has to play also in the offense, and then he has to foul as well. I mean, maybe in the NBA that's why it is easier. Also, also plus there is six fouls there, so you know. I they, think NBA did some adjustments to their rules. Because, because of the hack a shack, because back in the day you could foul a player that was wasn't in an active play. Yeah, so like Shaq didn't even 30, have the ball. Thirty yeah, meters exactly. away from Exactly, Shaq the didn't even have the ball. There's some San Antonio Spurs guy approaching him, and he just grabs him, and that's a foul. Classic. And Shaq goes to the line. And Coach Popovich did this numerous times, and eventually, I believe NBA had some adjustments to their rules, like if you foul on purpose a player that is not in an active play, mm. it's an automatic technical foul, uh, the team keeps the possession, and that- He has to have the ball in his hands. Yeah, basically, he has to have the ball in his hands, or he, or he has to be like in a pick and roll sequence mm. close to the ball, like he's the screener, Impacting and he's rolling, play. and you like, Grabbing yeah. his shirt, that's a foul. That's he, go, he goes to the line, but he's in an active play. Mm. Uh, I, I'm not sure in Europe, we do have the rule about the- Inbounding. Inbounding, yeah. Following the player on the court while the ball is still out of bounds, ready with the inbounder. Uh, yeah. But but about fouling a guy that's not in an active play, but do we have that? I mean, Nick it's just you have to avoid the enforcement. the ball like. in his hands, so yeah. it's yeah, Nick has to, the ball in his hands. It's easier to foul a Shaq. You just have to avoid the enforcement like foul, which which is obvious. Mm -hmm. But I remember this. Uh, you t you said you mentioned the Spurs doing that to Shaq all the time. Yeah. And then after when he switched teams, and uh, I think he was in the in the Phoenix at the moment. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> there's this great, yeah, <laughs> they did it in the first and and Shaq was like, Yo, what the fuck is going on? And he turns to Greg Popovich and Popovich has the <laughs> biggest smile on his face. On like the, yeah, yeah, That's they were 11 minutes and 57 seconds in, in the first quarter left. And, you know, Shaq they is were going trolling Shaq. I yeah. remember that. Yeah. 
so now we will see which coaching staff is actually listening to this podcast because as soon as <laughs> as soon as we no, will notice some hack and nick situations we who will, are playing it next? will be clear yeah who, who are following us who knows when they're you know i mean could play at home what about the games that have that have been postponed yeah uh, that's that's an issue of course and first of all we should start with yeah. with uh a huge support to all the people uh that suffered from the earthquake in Turkey and Syria I mean that's just shocking and uh also shout out to all the people doing a lot uh, supporting everybody like sh- what Shane Larkin does with his mm-hmm. foundation and yeah it's just a tough moment and just prayers and condolences go to all the victims of this horrible equ- earthquake a tragedy yeah this is Q&A podcast, guys. Uh, but what's unique about this one is that the entire episode will be public. One of the main reasons is also behind that. Uh, we're actually recording this pod on February 10th before Friday's ha- game. So we hope that there won't be like any 50 plus point games uh, this evening. Uh, I will be on a, a road trip. So we just wanted to do some content in advance for you to, to enjoy the podcast and at, at the same time to feel what our Q&A sessions are all about uh, because the entire episodes are available only for Beyond Plus members that you can become on basketnews.com slash plus. By the way, we have some great offers at the moment uh, for you to join our community and to get some extra content including Q&A episodes which we do every two weeks. Uh, additional Augustus uh, breakdowns, some opinion articles, and some great community that we have on WhatsApp uh, chat. So let's give a credit to our All-Star and GM uh, subscribers, uh, Paulus Tinteris, Hoofman, Kristas Pokitis, Gabrielus Serva, Audition 11, Luka Sucevic, uh, Jonut Georgescu. And thanks for our 100 Beyond Plus members that we have uh, at the moment. and who help us to create more content, to, to visit your league destinations, to visit other destinations, to create more content for you guys, uh, to enjoy and to feel uh, European basketball as as best as possible. Uh, by the way, a couple of news. Uh, next week, I think we will have our first BN Retro episode published. I saw raw material. We're still trying to make some cuts because even from raw material, it's about 40 minute content. So we have to cut it to make it at least up to 30 minutes or around 20 minutes. Uh, So I think it might be also another interesting angle of uh, European uh, basketball uh, coverage. And yeah, we can start with the questions. As always, BN Plus members has the priority. So we will start from their questions and we will try to answer as many questions as possible uh, due to time limitations. So let's start with Vasco. Uh, hello, here are my questions. After this NBA trade deadline, what's your, what's for you the favorite teams to clinch the finals and win it? Do you think the Mavericks gamble has any shots at it after the conference finals last year? Uh, no, I don't believe in the Dallas Mavericks, honestly. Uh, to me, their trade is mainly about whether they want to commit to Kyrie Irving or not. If they sign a long-term extension, then obviously they're trying to build on that. And this second part of the season will be dedicated towards Luka and Kyrie creating some sort of a bond. Uh, Yeah, they should be in the playoffs. They will be competitive. But I mean, the Western Conference right now looks so unpredictable and so crazy. It's so hard to say who's going to win it after what Phoenix did. The West got stacked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. I and love CJ McCollum's tweet uh, saying, you know, th- this all happened because Jamoran said he's good in the West. Yeah, <laughs> he had no problems with the West, but the, all of the, a sudden. The East was like, you know, did not change much. And, and the West is now, who knows mm-hmm. what's going to happen. So Phoenix, if, if everyone's healthy, they're a scary team, honestly. You have a starting lineup with CP3, Devin Booker, KD, uh Cam Johnson probably, and Deion Vaiton. Cam was wasn't he traded in in, who, in, in that who, deal? Who they they gave all the yeah all the three and D wings. So who who would be their starter? I think yeah, he, uh, was uh, he was Wa- traded. TJ Warren. Uh, yeah, uh, I saw Warren on some. TJ Warren some is, was what was in the trade package, right? So he he could he be went a, to Phoenix. Yeah, he could be a starter. Anyway, 
you should you should say it's a big four with CP3, Booker, mm. KD, and Aiton. If Aiton is committed, because so far this season he he seemed like he doesn't feel really appreciated in Phoenix. Uh, maybe the change of ownership added some positivity towards that, and they're just trying to be contenders right now. Because honestly, this season with all the injuries. It didn't look like Phoenix is a serious contender. And after the trade, when you when you bring KD, it's different. However, we have those health issues. Like KD is injured himself. Uh, CP3 had nagging injuries this season. Booker was out for a while. And who knows if everyone's healthy. Actually, I wouldn't sleep on the LA Clippers because they are a serious team. Probably they're doing some moves now to, mm. to sign Russell Westbrook. Because Proud. it looks like it, they traded John Wall, they traded Reggie Jackson, they cleared up a spot for a point guard, they added Eric Gordon, and uh, Russell Westbrook will be bought out of his contract, obviously, by, by the Utah Jazz. For sure. So maybe Clippers are targeting him, and they will have a very physical team, obviously. By the way, probably Tory Craig is going. Tory Craig. Tory Craig, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, forward. I forgot that I Cam I Johnson was. Traded. I don't think T.J. Warren is going to start there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't like the. I mean, I was buying into the hype with the Clippers uh, when Paul George signed and Kawhi, but I don't know. To me, that team is not uh, doesn't have enough pieces to you know compete with uh, great teams like Phoenix. Or Denver, you know, Denver to me is still playing amazing basketball. And many are saying they don't have enough star power and, you know, maybe their defense is not good enough you know, for, for the playoffs. But um, I don't know. I, w I want to see how this Phoenix uh, lineup works. Um, they have probably the most mid-range power that, you know, you can have in the NBA uh, in in all times, um, but if I had to pick a favorite a favorite to to win an NBA, to me that's still um, two teams from the East. That's uh, Boston and Milwaukee. I mean, these teams have been already with these rosters um, in at that play playing in the highest level, and um, these are all new teams like like Phoenix, like Dallas. Uh, I really, I'm really intrigued by the Dallas project. I, I don't think it's going to go to be, um, you know, just trying uh, to be to see how it works uh, with Kyrie and Luca there. Um, I believe, you know, last year and Dallas already went to the Western Conference Finals, and Luca was alone there. I mean, he had better help than they have right now. Uh, but you know, we all know that Luca has that extra gear in the playoffs and basically when it's all about the matchups he is the ultimate nightmare matchup and right now i see teams double teaming luca in the regular season yeah. just because how good he is like he's c coming in, in transition and they double team him at half court that's you know that's rare and and i'm not sure you can do that when you have now Kyrie. uh they had jalen brunson last season and the way he was performing in the playoffs you could say that was on a superstar level, the numbers in the Utah series, they actually started the Utah series without, without Luka Doncic. Luka. And, and everyone was saying, uh, oh, you know, Dallas probably will lose. And yeah. then just Brunson happened. Brunson was actually instrumental. Uh, and the problem for Dallas, I believe, that when they had this trip to the Western Conference Finals last year, the West was not as scary as it is right now. And if you look at the teams mm. that they beat, yes, I mean, they beat Phoenix in seven, but there was no good chemistry in Phoenix at the time. You could sense that something's wrong with the team and with <clears throat> all the stories behind yeah. the scenes with the owner. Um, you could sense that this True. Phoenix team is not coming back to the NBA Finals and they were really vulnerable and you could see that in, in the series. Right now, I mean, I agree with you about the East. And I agree with you that in general, Boston Celtics looks like the best team in the league. And Jan is probably the best player in the league. If he has Chris Middleton, they can go far. They added Jay Crowder. It's a very good addition for them. Uh, similarly to when they added PG Tucker and eventually mm. uh, they went all the way. So yeah, I agree. The East is, is kind of simple. It's Boston, Milwaukee, and the close third Philadelphia. Phil, Phil yeah. Three the teams. West is so unpredictable. 
I the don't. West, you have Denver, Memphis, uh, Clippers, the, Sixers, Dallas, Clippers, uh, Sixers and East. Oh yeah, I mean sorry. there are still Warriors. Yeah, in the exactly. Mix. They added. They you know retained Gary Payton, who was instrumental to their run. Yeah, so, a very good trade they did with James Wiseman. Actually, they got uh, draft picks. They cleared some cap space, uh, and and paying these luxury luxury tax taxes and don't not having any cap space for them was an issue rec in the mm -hmm. recent years because they couldn't have a good bench and i think that's a smart trade and for james wiseman maybe a different environment will be better for his own development uh he's supposed to start i saw in denver in, so. in detroit in detroit yeah, yeah. in, in Den detroit. denver got thomas bryant as a backup center which is also a good move you want to have a solid second unit when nikola Jokic is resting for his 12 or 14 minutes 10, during the game 10. playoffs probably but in the playoffs i don't bet on denver just because i i don't trust uh their defense i mean mm. Jokic will get exposed in pick and roll coverage uh, obviously it's happening in the regular season as well and for denver to be champions i do believe they need a second superstar that way I mean, they, Jamal Murray played like a superstar when he was healthy last time when he was in the playoffs maybe that's that's a possibility I don't rule it out completely but if I'm like guessing who's gonna win the West I would favor Memphis Phoenix and LA Clippers mm -hmm. although Denver is a regular season machine when everyone's healthy they are obviously the best regular season team but we know that regular season is a different story and you're not even we're not even talking about you know the third seed sacramento kings i don't <laughs> see them as style like contenders that. although making the yeah. playoffs is already a good achievement for them yeah i checked how bookmakers feel uh, after the trade deadline and they still consider boston celtics as the front runners to win the title suns made a biggest jump from the ninth position i think to the second one then they rank uh, Milwaukee Bucks as the third team to win the title. Then there's goes Nuggets, Clippers, and Sixers. So that's their top six. And we didn't even mention Pel Pelicans. With healthy yeah. Zion, before his injury, they were top five team in the league. That is just crazy. I mean, the Western we Conference are just saying, we we're talking about like eight, nine teams who. Yeah. I Sounds mean, like we we're talking about the Euroleague title contention. It's kind of the same. I, I, I think that the Western Conference is so stacked; it, it has even more contenders than than Euroleague. Honestly, yeah, could be, or at least the same or, or amount of legit contenders to win the conference. And I'm just so happy about it because we we got so used to the idea that it's going to be Warriors versus LeBron in the finals, and we were living like that mm -hmm. for. How many years? I'm not even. I'm not even sure. Four. Uh, and LeBron winning the East for ten <laughs> years or something that was crazy. like that. And I'm LeBron. I am the finals. <laughs> during the regular season, like one year, I, I remember Charles Barkley said before the season, "Okay, let's start this crazy ride and pretend for a whole year that it's yeah. not going to be Warriors versus LeBron, <laughs> LeBron once again." James. And it was like this. You couldn't imagine any other team winning the Western Conference other than Warriors, mm. even before they signed KD. And now the landscape is so different. The Western Conference is so evenly matched. After this trade deadline, it's even crazier. So I just, I, I'm just loving it. I believe that for some teams, the playoffs start now, because obviously you want, to, you want to avoid the play-in. In Lakers' case, you want to at least make the play-in. Although Lakers made some good moves, I, I wanted to they ask, improved the team. I wanted yeah. to ask, how do you feel about the trades? Because, I mean, obviously, you know, LeBron wanted Kyrie there. But uh, what they did is, you know, like, I mean, I would say pretty good moves. But compared to what happened uh, with other teams in the West, then you kind of, you know, yeah, we could have, we could have done better. But I agree. I mean, I think they made the moves to make them more uh S suitable players to play with lebron i mean yeah Malik to be beasley. surrounded by better shooters like beasley is a good addition you have vanderbilt as a pretty solid uh, defensive type of guy very mm -hmm. athletic player uh and d'angelo russell should be a better fit than russell westbrook was obviously 
before they made a trade for Rui Hachimura, which al also mm. made sense. They wanted to add some size and physicality. So they made good moves. I, I'm not sure if Pat Beverly traded to Mo Bamba makes much difference, but in general, they made good moves, but probably it's too late and they didn't add a, any game changers like Kyrie Irving would be a game changer for sure. So mm. at best, I see them in the play-in, but I don't put them in the contenders list, honestly. I don't no, think no. they got better. No. They will have better spacing for sure. But no. you know, with better spacing, you uh, there comes problems in defense because you know they, they basically what they did is right now they sacrificed a little bit of defense for a little bit of more of shooting. You know, mm. so it, it's going to be interesting to see. They are two and a half games away from the plane, and. Um, Four and a half games from the sixth spot. I don't see them in the sixth, honestly. At best, they, they make it to the play-in tournament. And I'm not saying they're not going to be in the playoffs, but I would be surprised if they make the playoffs and win a series. Because honestly, if you match the Lakers right now with any of those other teams that we've mentioned, I don't see them winning a best of seven. No way. Even if LeBron is putting up these numbers every single night. Mm. I mean, LeBron had... LeBron just showed that if he decides to have 36, he will have 36. That's what happened on his uh, Everything was rec planned. Rec Everything record was nine. Planned there. I mean, it's not that difficult for him to get 36 if yeah. he is determined to do so. But they lost to, to OKC. They lost the game. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, it was all about LeBron and, and Kareem was in the building and so many celebrities and his family, his friends, and everybody celebrated LeBron. But yeah, they lost to OKC. They need wins now to make the play. That's in. true. And, and they just lost the game because they were not defending very well. And LeBron was scoring, fair enough. I mean, you knew uh, the way I saw, the moment I saw how LeBron was dressed up for the game, <laughs> dressed up for the game, I was like, yeah. <laughs> it's about to go this down today. The record is about to go down today. We have LeBron question by Vasco. Who is the GOAT for you? Should we split the best career ever and the best player ever award? Or do you think we can't? Maybe you already answered this. Ah, okay. Never mind. And thank you very much. Greetings from Portugal, everyone. Obrigado. Nice. I love Portugal so much. After last summer, I said to my girlfriend and she agreed that this is where I want to live. You've been to <laughs> Lisbon, yeah. Porto? Uh, so far, to, I've, I've, I've been only to Lisbon and around, uh, but I'm planning to visit Porto and, and other cities. Porto we is amazing great as well. Islands as well. We had, yeah. after wedding, we were planning a trip, but then COVID happened, so it changed I just loved plans. everything, the people, the climate, uh, the food, everything was so perfect to me. And anyway, let's, let's focus on yeah, the goat question, question about the goat. We can focus on Portugal too. <laughs> <laughs> well, my honest uh, take about the Go discussion in every sport is that we should decide on who is the best in his era. It's unfair to compare players from the 80s with players that we have right now. I mean, if you watch any game from the 80s or even the 90s, you see that there's not that much talent. Uh, there's not too many players that can shoot the free. The basketball is different. The skill sets are different. And even comparing Michael Jordan to LeBron James doesn't make any sense. And when you try to compare players based on their titles, it also doesn't make any sense because you need to look at the context. I mean, LeBron James was always winning the ease, but he was always facing a team like Golden State Warriors. What could he do in some of those finals? I mean, people are always saying, look, Jordan didn't lose a final and, and LeBron lost how many finals? But what could he do in these uh, uh, series, like against the Warriors or when he was almost a teenager facing the San Antonio Spurs? Mm. He carried the Cavaliers team throughout the East and then they were facing this scary monster built by Greg Popovich. What could he do? <laughs> of course he lost those finals. So I don't know. To me, LeBron is the best player of his era. In, I mean, the OOs, the 10s, the 20s still probably. Two decades. <laughs> Almost three, well, That's two decades crazy. at least, right? We have Kobe, of course. Uh, a lot of people would say Kobe, and they wouldn't be wrong. I mean, Kobe and LeBron probably are the goats of these two eras. Then we have 
Michael Jordan as the obvious goat for, for 90s mm. and part of the 80s. Then we have Magic, then we have Bird. And I don't like saying, like, uh, putting statements like LeBron is better than MJ. Uh, to me, it it's, it's make silly. Sense. To like, me, it's silly. Yeah. I know that would that would get uh, people going on social media and, you know, probably the most viral tweets uh, have been written in Twitter history uh, where people are just comparing the titles and uh, making these meme, a lot of different memes uh, by just comparing two players by different from, from there, each point of view, like you take a random fact and then it's like, oh, so if this random fact is in mm -hmm. MJ's favor, then MJ is the GOAT. But look, LeBron is have done this and this, this, that. Like yeah. you just post categories where LeBron is superior to MJ and, and, and say, oh, uh, so LeBron is better. And like, it just doesn't make sense for me to compare, for me to compare these two players. Like who is the GOAT? For for many for many um, parts, LeBron is superior, like longev longevity, you know, yeah. uh, all around game stuff like that. Like MJ played probably, you know, m a more beautiful type of basketball. You know, uh, the one you I personally would watch more often than LeBron. Let's say you know because LeBron is still. LeBron is right now the have the most points scored in the NBA history. At the same time being but one I, of the best passers. One of the best pack. He's fourth, the I think, four, yeah. in, uh, in assists. But I still don't know. I mean, I know right now he's probably going to step back for a, pre, for a free pointer, you know, at the end of the game. But you still don't know his, what, what is his go-to move, you know, like other players would use to have. And he's just, you know, using his uh, sheer power and, and athleticism to get to get to the rim. And that's, you know, so so in that part, you know, yeah, MJ is, to me, just more beautiful to watch. And, and th does this count to the GOAT conversation? Like, you know, he has more titles and stuff know. like that. So And when you also have all these bigs like Hakeem Olajuwon, Shaquille O'Neal, Tim Duncan, where do you measure them? How do you rank them in, in these discussions? Oh, it's, it's for the big guys, it's even, you know, tougher because, you know, the... The argument that you have to be a ball handler, probably to be—it's also unfair. It's also because unfair. different Dude, eras. That's true. Different eras had different players. Uh, at one point, Shaq was the most dominant player true. in the league, and nobody could stop him. Uh, now we have a different type of era. The bigs are shooting freeze. Joel Embiid, with his body in the '90s or '80s, he would play under the rim in physical battles. Right now, he does everything. So. Mm. To me, it's unfair, Just, and also the argument when some people say that, uh, look, you put LeBron in the 90s and the 80s, he would dominate as well. There was not that much talent in the league. Fair. But can you imagine Larry Bird or Michael Jordan playing now, these days, with today's technology, medicine, um, training, and everything? They would be superstars, just as they were. Uh, they would probably in, be even better than in they their were. years. Yeah, for sure. So. That's that's why I uh, enjoy you know um, comparing uh, you know if if let's say let's say who had a better career MJ or LeBron probably choose LeBron right at this point like just thinking that he'll have additional two years but it depends on who you count as a better career yeah. somebody counts titles uh, as the best indicator was the good career to but me honestly somebody else counts this record all time scoring I'm sorry to interrupt but to answer the question who had a better career. I would say MJ if Washington didn't happen. Mm. Because what can be better than finishing your career with a game-winning shot in the NBA yeah. Finals? But Iconic. then Washington happened. It does probably it, was a mistake. But does then it take you have away LeBron from his playing and for Lakers losing, losing Lakers in the last few of his but last know, seasons. And, so. But he's still uh, chasing and making these records. He's but still relevant. That's time. the thing. He's still relevant. Yeah. To the league yeah but these records i mean He's the scoring. game is so different scoring pace is so different that a lot of people put this as an argument that oh he became an all-time scorer so he has another you know advantage over mg but the scoring pace the game itself the style of the play yeah the amount of three pointers that were made in those years i mean it it, it helped them 
uh, to, to to come on the top. Sure, but a lot but, more, but, you know, a lot more freeze, but still. But you know, honestly, if you put LeBron right now on 30, a better th- team, they would be a contender per game. And how many years it took to to break Kareem's record? Like forty years, I believe. So and now they we, said that they said you know, everyone said that this record is uh, untouchable. Can, yeah, untouchable. Now it will probably take forty more years to break LeBron's career because uh, LeBron's record. I think there knows, somebody I mean, sc- scoring counted is, that Luka Doncic might be yeah. he's on the pace to break the record. But if he's I don't see Luka playing Luka, until thirty six, I don't see him also being true. having this longevity as you, LeBron. You did. have to play probably until thirty eight. And know, for in LeBron's case, it helps that you enter the league uh, after high school, being eighteen years old, and from the rookie season, you're already. Uh, putting up numbers, that, averages like twenty per game. Like Yanis, when he entered the league, his first two seasons, he yeah, didn't yeah. really he average. Was a uh, a but, lot Lu- of but Luca, when he entered, uh, he was nineteen. He was nineteen, 19 and then yeah. and so. But we just he, don't see Luca playing until that's true. he doesn't see himself playing until thirty eight. That's, that's what he how he answered the question uh, about LeBron, and he said, uh, probably in, when I'm thirty eight, I see myself more in the farm. In Slovenia, then yeah. playing in the NBA. So, <laughs> but but still, you know wh- why he's that? Why that's possible is because the scoring is increasing every year. The pace is increasing every year. The amount of frees are increasing mm-hmm. every year, and you have Luca uh, playing in this type of ba- playing this type of basketball since he came into the league. So his scoring averages are already perfect, and they are I think growing each year, and so. Maybe with the way basketball is going, you will see in him, you will see Luca averaging even more in the next years, and that you know could help. But that's still you know to beat it's still a long all shot. time oh, yeah. Yeah. scoring record. You need to not have injuries, serious injuries, and you need to play at least until you need to have 38. this goal to have your son playing together on the same. And team. honestly, in this uh, answer, you all also put. An answer to the question about the goat. After twenty years, we will have new goats. We'll have a new era. We will. We are yeah. already talking about Yanis, Luka, and, and Jokic. So in twenty years, it will be a different discussion. We will have different players with different accolades, titles. What, and, what and will, so? So what will be the question after twenty years? What will the question be? So is it LeBron or Luka or Jokic or, Giannis, or yeah. is it MJ or? Yanis, Luka, it all depends Yogi. on on, on <laughs> championships. On, no, honestly, we have to decide this one right now <laughs> <laughs> because when you have this narrative about the best player, you always talk not only about his skills uh, but so how many rings he has. So that's important. Yeah, and honestly, I don't rule out LeBron James still having a push mm. on a contender. Not right now with the way the Lakers are, but who knows? He's probably going to play at least two more years. Yeah, let's appreciate the greatness we're witnessing. Amazing. Uh, Odris has a question. Uh, if Andal makes the playoffs in fifth or fifth to eighth place, do you think they make the final four? Personally, I think they have an advantage playing only one game instead of series. Do mm. they? I'm not so sure. Mm. I'm not so sure. Uh, well, again, yeah. it depends mm. on who 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 will they face. It's not about the fifth seed or sixth seed. It's, yeah, it's, it's more, more about the matchup. The matchup, who you're yeah. facing. However, I would probably, and as I think right now, I would probably agree that the way they're playing this year, they have an advantage if they play one game. I'm not buying that they can play good for a series. I just don't see, I mean, 20 plus games have passed. The habits I see on the court... Uh, haven't changed from the start of the season. And, uh, you know, yeah, everyone is saying they will flip the switch once the playoff comes, but uh, I'm not sure you can do that when you play in this way for 30 games and then just, okay, now it's the playoffs, we have to turn up. I don't know. I don't know if you can do that for five games straight, for three games straight, whatever the opponent might be. Okay, but if we have five teams, for example, that are possible opponents for FS, Mm -hmm. that's... Olympiacos, uh, Real Madrid, Barcelona, Monaco, Monaco and Fener. maybe Fenerbahce. So out of these five, I would take FS over Fenerbahce and Monaco. Yeah, me too. True. I w- probably would take them over Barcelona, uh, but I wouldn't take them over Olympiacos. 
and I probably wouldn't take them over Real Madrid. Real Madrid. Although for me, it looks like they all should be like game five series. Yeah, probably. They're so close. Probably. What's What's interesting that so far they're one and three uh, playing away with the top five teams. And last year they actually beat Milan uh, without having a home advantage, but Milan had a, Milan a lot had of injuries. So it was injuries. a different conversation. It was a good matchup for them to sneak into the final four. So it depends only on the matchups, not uh, seeds. And uh, Odris has another question. Check out places to stay in Kaunas for the final four weekend on Booking.com. Which one would you recommend? Some are quite creative and funny, in my opinion. Stay in Vilnius and just make a trip to Kaunas. Yeah. I've heard that. I didn't check, but I've heard that Vilnius prices are way better than Kaunas. And it's not that far away. You can jump on, on the train and in one hour, you're basically in, in the arena. Train, car, share, 50, car sharing, bus. Uh, yeah. The train station is like 15 minutes uh, walk. Yeah. From, from 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 the, the arena. arena, so I would also go for the option. Uh, when we were covering Jadgir's games, uh, I would always travel by train, and they would have a late train back to Vilnius after the game, and it was so comfortable. I think it's the better option because uh, when you check the prices for hotels in Konas during yeah. that weekend, they're so inflated, it's very expensive, honestly. Yeah. Unless you have some friends you can crash in their place, mm. that would be fun, obviously, because there will be a lot of basketball fans and to enjoy the nightlife in between games probably will be fun. Yeah, you should stay somewhere in the old town, I think, Vilnius old town. A lot of great bars, nightclubs, and I really believe that during the Final Four they will do something about the train schedules to make more trains after games. They some, should. Some late Pretty sure. I've, I'm sure that it it will be like that, so... I really recommend checking Vilnius instead of going to some super expensive or shitty areas of, of Konas. Jonut Georgescu. Hello, guys. I would love to hear your take on the rise of Polus Motiunas from a pre press officer to the president and shareholder of Jalgiris and how a disaster, the departure of Romanov, who left the club in depths, was shifted to become an opportunity, especially for Polus due to his approach on managing currently, correctly, uh, Jalgiris Arena. Basically, from we from we save it we run it that's actually a great story i mean one of the <laughs> most greatest euroleague success stories because polus was invited to work as the media officer by former Jalgris gm Ginas rutkauskas and i remember even polus told that he didn't have any clue about how media should work what he should do so it was just a first job for him to do and he he wasn't very comfortable with it but he was into basketball yeah, he was he was always into basketball, and I think that his he has mentioned he played for the uh, Vadu University, University for many years. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I even remember we had this journalist tournament game against Lithuanian Basketball Federation team. Paulus Matinas was on that team, and Arvidas Sabonis was on that team, and we won that game after the game winner from the half court. Oh, I over remember Arvidas that Sabonis. shot. That shot went, I mean, sort of viral. It was <laughs> better than Derek Sharp shot. Yeah. <laughs> No, but to, to, to be real, I think that Polus story is an example of some loyal and humble worker of basketball club who, okay, he got this position, but he always was looking for something more. I mean, how to help the team in some different ways. And of course, if that tragedy didn't happen, probably Ghost would have go uh, different. But basically, he was the only guy uh, who took the responsibility to run the club was about to go bankrupt and i think that he was risking on some you know institutional things as a director of the organization which goes to bank bankrupt so nobody wanted to take over the team so he took over he found a plan uh, how to try to solve those uh, debts it took many years it took many difficult conversations uh, with players to find those those uh, agreements and somehow he managed uh, to pull that out. Of course, that deal with the arena, that they, they they had the contract with the arena to basically run the arena for 20 years, I think, helped a lot uh, to, to survive uh, for Jalgiris. And basically, he, both him and Arvida Sabonis, they basically became shareholders. So it's, it's a lot of coincidences, but at the same time, a lot of hustle, uh, hungriness uh, for, for Paulus Matiunas. And with Shara's becoming the head coach and you really having this new format, the yeah. sold out era began. Yeah. 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 
And, and that's that, that how they say the organization. How they say you don't get like people don't get lucky. They put themselves in positions to get lucky. Yeah. They get themselves Pol- Pol- ready. Montejunas did exactly that. I mean, just yeah. taking taking that taking Jalgiris from all the, all the depths, and and then uh, you know managing the club the right way and and having the patience to see the to see the team grow. And that to me that's probably the most uh, astonishing thing mm. about his from rise press officer to basically club owner it's that's like that's one of you know one of the most underrated you could, stories you could make documentary it, i think a, about yeah. about that it's a big thing honestly it's like eric spolstra from video coordinator to the most respected nba head coach right mm-hmm. now yeah. yeah there was that photo about him like i think 1999 where spolstra working at working as the with video coordinator with tapes with with the tapes yeah. yeah and then just him standing on the sidelines yeah the second question 10, 15 years later the second question by Yonut. uh the hidden f- hidden figures of euroleague people who are not in the spotlight i would name i would name some examples especially from the front office and if you can comment and continue with other examples staff front office or ownership so Alfredo Salazar for recruiting the backcourt uh, of Basconia, Cecho Mulero for making Valencia a perennial EuroCup champion and a very competitive opponent this year, Ave Even, next GM of Maccabi, probably the ultimate multiplayer. Mm. Do you have any other names who you think they deserve more credit? Um, I'm not sure about other names, but I could expand about what what was mentioned. Like Ave Even right now is creating a sort of Real Madrid environment in Maccabi with these long-term contract extensions they're doing with Zoe Brown, with Roman Sorkin, and probably there are more I was so surprised with uh, Lorenzo's extension. Not too many clubs do that in Europe and can afford that. Basically, it was just Real Madrid. And Olympiacos. Where is your surprise from his part or from Maccabi's part? From, um, from Maccabi, it's obvious. From his part, having Spanish passports, basically you become eligible to, to lead teams like Real Madrid. Why you were surprised from their part? Uh, I'm not surprised from their part. For Maccabi, it's obvious move. You, yeah. you sign Lorenzo Brown for so as long as So you're surprised with Lorenzo signing it? Yeah. But I mean, they give you a contract till 2026, you're safe. But I thought that You're a in summer player. he was already under the contract for the next year as well. But in in summer you might have more options to go for Madrid if they they will go crazy about some moves of the new head coach. But I mean he's the best, one of the probably top three point guard in the Euroleague market. But he will always have options. He's uh, thirty one right now, I believe. Or thirty or thirty two. Yeah, yeah. And when you when mm. you're happy in a club in an environment like Tel Aviv, and they give you a three year extension. But, t- but the happiness in Tel Aviv is always related to the season. Scotty Wilbekin was also very happy at first, and then a lot of cha- things have changed. So, but if I'm a 32 year old uh, veteran point guard, I'm signing. I mean, that. I'm signing. I mean, a not, that's a great, extension. great city, great place to live. Uh, if you're happy, you're you have the keys to the team. You're leading that team. You're playing the best basketball of, of your career. You know, yeah. excluding the. Eurobasket tournament. It's not like Lorenzo is losing in this situation. Of course, no. uh, bigger paycheck, long-term deal, great city, uh, Tel Aviv, uh, great organization, great fans. But probably depends on his priorities. If he wants to put himself in a position to win, of course, Real Madrid, for instance, is that club that puts you in a better situation to, uh, to win. All the NBA environment around you, the contract they, they may offer. I mean, I still think that Madrid would be the better case for him. But of course, we're talking about just basically one team, uh, probably. So Maccabi mm-hmm. can be contenders with the right moves and with what they are doing right now, long-term contracts. I could see them being contenders next season. This season, they are playoff contenders, but not title contenders. But I do believe they have everything to to build a solid championship caliber team. Wade Baldwin is playing like he wants uh, also an extension. And there are talks <laughs> about him extending mm. his contract, right? Yeah. His performances when Lorenzo got injured are amazing, really. Uh, and the other people mentioned, obviously, Basconia, for years, they are the team that find these hidden gems and players that... Uh, later af- go af- on after to have be, an amazing career um, yeah later go on to be Euroleague stars I, I once built a roster of former Basconia players that are currently playing in Euroleague and I actually ha- had to leave out some big names because not everybody fit in a 12 12 man roster 
but you have Shane Larkin, you have Mike James, you have uh, Ronnie Bobois, you have Doko Shengelia, so many players. I mean, and, even from the current wow. players, you know, Marcus Howard, Pierre Henry. Mm -hmm. Darius Thompson. Darius Thompson. Matt Costello is going to have a... He's having a good career, but I yeah. believe he will have a, another big contract in, in the upcoming year. So they're doing something special, really. Yeah, I would also mention Barcelona assistant coach Thomas Masulis. I'm hearing a lot of great feedback about uh, about him. He's super important. Uh, Shulna Sesikavich's coaching staff, and he was already doing a great job in, when he was working in Jargiris. He started from the youth team, and he was doing incredible uh, stuff with, with Jargiris' uh, youth team. Then, I mean, probably we don't need to mention people like Mauricio Gerardini and uh, how he changed the culture in Fenerbahce. Fenerbahce was never that much respected team in, in Europe. They weren't winning organization before he joined. Of course, there was Jelko Bradovic, but I mean, Gerardini built the culture. He showed it know-how, and now they're just uh, continue to follow. Um, shout out to Rokas Miskevich, uh, Lithuanian working for Monaco team. They have a very... Uh, small uh, front office. So basically, Rogas Miskavichus is a man orchestra who covers a lot of daily but necessary stuff uh, in Monaco. And uh, there are a lot of funny stories about him being, you know, sleepless, always drinking coffee, smoking cigarettes. So we wish health to Rokas because <laughs> he's just putting a lot of energy uh, for Monaco to build up the reputation uh, in the EuroLeague. Uh, I would say Daniele Boyes is a brilliant sports director with enormous basketball knowledge. Uh, he's working for uh, Bayern Munich. And I also love their GM, Marco Pesic, very innovative leader of an organization. Also, shout out to Alba Berlin and their sports director, Himar Oyeda, another great basketball hunter because he kind of found uh, uh, Eddie Tavares. I mean, he just started his career in Gran Canaria. Uh, and then now you see players like Chris Kumaje, who was also followed closely by Oyeda. He's, he's always going to these tournaments and states to check for, for the next uh, uh, rising stars uh, in the EuroLeague. And of course, they're giving this crazy platform for Alba Berlin in the EuroLeague. Um, I think that Jakub Sekiskok, uh, FS assistant coach, deserves a lot of uh, credit. Uh, we all see only Ergin Ataman uh, in that team, but I think that Jakub Sekiskok, uh, Sekiskok is that hard worker who put, makes a lot of uh, work that we don't see. Uh, and actually, uh, Restar uh, GM, probably one of the youngest uh, GMs in the EuroLeague, Nemanja Vasilievich, he's a very competitive guy very aggressive pushing some ideas he has many ideas how your league could develop and and could work so he's his interesting name uh from the front office and i'm definitely missing somebody else because there are a lot of people that we don't see because i also think that it's related to the fact that uh we have too many untold stories in the year league because of the exposure that the league doesn't get and that's what we we are actually trying to do as Basket News uh, website, both on this podcast or on some other stories to show the not just those heroes we saw on a weekly basis, but who are working uh, behind the scenes. And the last question by Jonut, uh, what's the future of EuroCup in your perspective? Champions League became already a better competition and a better product, in my opinion. The kindergarten of EuroLeague status is not enough anymore. Sad future, I would say. If, uh, you know, listening to your interview, Marshall Glickman said that EuroLeague is probably going to expand. And so what are you going to do? Or are you going to take some teams that are from the Euro Cup? And then, then what's left, you know, from the names there in the Euro Cup? And I don't know, the, with the way Champions League are working, especially with their marketing, um, you know, I don't hear when I'm not searching for Euro Cup or Champions League, I don't hear anything about the Euro Cup, but I hear or I see something about the Champions League almost almost, you know, on on, on a weekly basis. So I, uh, I think it's also pretty easily explained. Champions League is the main product of FIBA and that's EuroLeague's true. main product is EuroLeague. So Euro Cup is just a secondary uh, thing. Uh, they're not putting a lot of uh, investments in that uh, tournament. Yeah, but that's why that, that's why you know, and you get this result that that people are saying right now. You know, asking questions like, you know, uh, FIBA Champions League are already a better product in in my eyes. Uh, 
so you know not taking basketball level level there mm, yeah i think uh champions league has a brighter future than euro cup yeah I uh, but anyways this second european tournament will, will always be dominated by the spanish teams and if you like uh, cancel euro cup then you add Joventut Badalona to the FIBA Champions League or and Gran Canaria and you have <laughs> even more Spanish teams in the FIBA Champions League and almost every year one of those teams will will win the title but I do agree that um, Euro Cup is becoming more and more unnecessary every single mm -hmm. year and they're experimenting a lot with the format they have this 10 terrible team regular season and after that just one game playoffs knockout tournament basically which i don't really like uh so right now euro cup is still kind of relevant because it gives you a euro league spot but honestly as a product as a basketball competition it's every single year it, it, it's getting lower and lower and lower and i believe for for the whole landscape of european basketball it would be healthier to just have a strong second competition and in this case probably under FIBA's flag like you have the Euro League and you have the FIBA Champions League as a rivaling league or the second league in in Europe mm. and Euro Cup is just destined to be somewhere in between I I don't think that Euro Cup is going to last much longer especially if they're going to expand I mean war was a game changer for them because usually basically they lost a couple of very strong Russian teams then a lot of Eurocup powerhouses like uh, Partizan Virtus uh, went to the EuroLeague, uh, some other clubs, including uh, Monaco. So taking out the best teams uh, of the competition, it would be the same if we would exclude top five of the EuroLeague teams right now. The level, the competition, the and the standard would be also uh, a bit uh, different. But I agree with Ritas. I, I also think that it would be just a bit clearer to have EuroLeague, yeah, and then we have the secondary... Uh, not only competition, they're also doing FIBA Eurocup, but the, the whole pyramid would be more clear and understandable for basketball fans in Europe. Because to follow all those tournaments, I mean, then they have those Northern Europe uh, leagues. It's just there is not enough, unnecessary confusion. There is not enough attention to basketball in Europe to have four tournaments mm -hmm. international and in on international level in Europe. And, you know, it's better to have less of them but with more quality and to have four of them you know some teams are not even participating in the fourth one because they are not seeing the economic uh you know investment being worth it you know they're saying we're not we are trying we are trying to get to the champions league fiba champions league through the qualifying but if we are if we don't qualify we don't want to play in the in the fiba euro cup because it just doesn't make sense to us nobody Nobody will are going to come watch games, and the cost of participating mm. is just going to be bigger than than what we are going to get. So, um, to me, it's just too many tournaments, and it, it's better. It would be better to have two. That's it. Tudor Minku or Minsu. Uh, hello, I just joined the community, and I'm glad to be part of it. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Tudor. Here are some questions. Maybe you'll find some interesting topics. So. Which is the biggest rivalry in Euroleague history, both on team level and maybe even between players? I'd say Panathinaikos and Olympiakos because yeah. they have been rivals for decades and we have seen both of these teams on the rise and on the fall. Uh, whether you take the 90s, the OOs, the 10s, because the Belgrade Derby as people said to us, it's, it's the eternal, eternal derby, derby, they call mm. it, is just becoming relevant now in, yeah. in, in EuroLeague's context. I'm not saying locally, but in yeah. EuroLeague context. And Olympia Kospan at Nikos has always been there. Mm. And we know the titles of these teams. We know how great power was under Želko Bradovic. We know what Olympiakos did with uh, Duda Ivkovic. So, yeah, I would take those. Greek teams but between players I'm not sure I don't know we don't really have these there's no such type of thing no in Kobe here, LeBron here. no Magic Larry Bird Michael we Jordan don't have stories. these rivalries in people Europe, yeah. uh players don't have interactions 
uh, you know, in this way on social There's media. There's only rivalry I know is between Wade Baldwin and Brandon Paul probably, <laughs> <laughs> and Will Cherry. Yeah, probably that's the biggest rivalry we Last have. Last season we had some sort of rivalry <laughs> between Kostas Papanikolaou and Wayne Bacon in, yeah. a, in a playoff series. You can see that Laren Zykes, Mike James is becoming a thing <laughs> yeah, as well. Yeah, but that's just matchups. Like, yeah. in, it's good that you mentioned like Magic and Bird because that was the whole era yeah, of, ba of basketball. NBA build up their it brand. was Magic versus Bird. You make documentaries about Magic versus Bird. Not necessarily Lakers versus Celtics, but Magic versus Bird. In mm -hmm. Europe, it doesn't go like that. And it, Team, it's, it, teams. It, it's also related to the fact that many players are usually under one year contract or one plus one. They they will look for a better contract in the free agency. And it's it's more about teams because roster changes drastically over the years. Mm. You don't have players with like five or six year contracts being in a position to create his own legacy. It it rarely happens, you know. People and people don't change the, the teams they support uh, according to their favorite player, you know. Yeah. Everyone has the team mm. and the team is above anything else. Very rarely you see, you know, fans that have, I don't know, uh, supporting Vasilya Mitic for to t to take an example and you know supporting Jaligris and then supporting uh, Dolo Efes like who is doing that in, in Europe? The His friends only. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The second question: Which was your favorite coach, player, executive to interview so far? I'll try to be quick. Uh, I, of course, I forgot a lot of interviews I made. Trinkieri. Trinkieri from the coaching standpoint, Mike James, I think he has so many thoughts about the game and usually he goes against the flow. So uh, it's always uh, entertaining. entertaining to hear. And from the executive side, I really loved how innovative was Marco Pesic and Mauricio Gardini is always like an open book. You just read and soak all, all the information. Uh, Urosh, another BN Plus member, has a question about uh, Maccabi. Didn't Blad himself help Maccabi build this team, unlike previous Maccabi rosters where Nikola Vucic teams had the heavy centers and old-fashioned play style? I wouldn't say that Maccabi, even with Vucic, was old-fashioned. They were always like American-style basketball uh, approach uh, teams. They were... just had Ante Zizic. Yeah, but it's not like it's normal to have one center. Yeah, like that. basically all Euroleague teams has one traditional uh, center. But yeah, Blad's impact was higher because he joined the front office. Uh, let's say in the last uh, summer. Let's let's go through the public questions we have because we're running out of time a little bit. So let's be quicker with those. Uh, once again, join BN Plus community on basketnews.com slash plus. We have some great offers uh, uh, to join this community and be on the priority list whenever we come up with the Q&A episode. So, Dinktiv has a question about Dwight Howard. Which EuroLeague team would benefit the most from having Dwight Howard on their roster this season? <laughs> I think <laughs> EuroLeague would benefit from having Dwight Howard. But not the team. Uh, I'm not so sure. I mean, if you somehow convince Dwight to be serious about his role and to do things for the team, then maybe some teams could use him. But nah, I don't see that. I can't imagine. I'm sorry. If that team is looking for getting wins, <laughs> me too. <laughs> really. Fit-wise, you can think about Aswell when, you know, Laverne got injured, so they kind of need a big center, but it's like, mm, I don't know. Zalgiris. Look, ima imagine Dwight uh, playing today against Bosconia. I, I saw some highlights. He, he had some crazy matchup, and, and he's playing in Taiwan, right? Against Sim Taiwan. Simbular? Yeah, I mean, it was, like, it was like a joke video. Really, it's, it, does, it didn't look like a real basketball game. <laughs> He's going through a free Man. point, free point contest. <laughs> He's gonna participate. So, I remember once Jalgir signed Rod Strickland. I was so excited. He was thirty nine years old. Rod Strickland didn't arrive at the airport, <laughs> and after that, they signed Kenny Anderson. He was, was also 40. a big. <laughs> no, he wasn't forty. He okay, was a bit younger. He looked like a forty. Year he, old guy. He, yeah, he did. But uh, I mean, it was a pretty big NBA name. 
but on the court it didn't really work. Uh, I don't know, Dwight Howard. Panathinaikos could be crazy <laughs> enough no, to sign don't him. Don't go there. I'm just saying. <laughs> Carlos Montaner uh, Pero, uh, I would like you taking risks and try to, to predict the eight teams at the playoffs and why you will choose them based on what has been seen so far and which ones will get close, but finally you don't believe they will reach the goal. Oh so my we, God. we kind of all agreed on top five, right? Olympiacos, Madrid, Barca, Fener, Monaco. Although I'm not saying that Fener is, is yeah. untouchable because they're not playing particularly great basketball for the last couple of months. True. Um, they have actually, uh, Monaco, last, last 10 games well. they have four and six. Four and six Monaco which is, is five and five. Yeah. Which is uh, 12, 12 best. And they're period. just like two wins away, two losses basically away from yeah. missing the playoff picture. It's so hard with these top eight predictions because like four weeks ago you would go with Zvezda, right now you want yeah. to go with Partizan. And then you Partizan think that has maybe been playing great then you think yeah, you might uh, trust Maccabi and then they lose home game against Red Star, who you kind of thought that maybe it's time to rule them out. So And, and that was a really important game for them <laughs> as well. Very important game. I mean, at home they were 9-1. and one. I was writing an article yesterday about Maccabi mm. and their, uh, you know, homesickness. And I was like, yeah, today they are going to win against Vezda. It's a must win for them. Bam, they lose. And they have the one of the worst records of playing away. So, yeah. I would still go with the six, <coughs> Olympiacos, Real Madrid, Barcelona, Monaco, Fenerbahce, and Efes. I think oh, Efes yeah, will I've be there. Also have Efes. So then you leave these two spots, and I remember in one podcast, as you said, Basconia and Zvezda. I'm sticking to Basconia. Not so sure about Zvezda right now, but I'm still thinking about Campazzo coming back. That should influence uh, their game a lot. Uh, Partizan is a, in a great form, nine and two in the yeah, last. Yeah, I watched games. their game yesterday. The top, at the best offensive rating in the last ten games. Top four defense. Huge they're, adjustment they're they clicking, made. They're clicking right now. It's so hard to decide. It's true that you know la their Partizan's last games have been against Bayern, Jalgiris, Asvel, Zvezda, Valencia, Basconia, okay. Maccabi. So, you know. Not the top top teams. They're gonna have a difficult but still, schedule. You know, they have won away three times. Uh so now they play Alba, they have Virtus, they have Milan. But to, to finish the season they will have an Adolo away, Olympia Cos at home, Barcelona at home, Real Madrid at home, Monaco away, and Pau is their, their last game. Like at that, least at home. I mean, at least they are yeah, facing these big three, teams. Three at games, home. three games at home. I will try to be more consistent. Mm. I said Basconia, Zvezda, I will try to stick to my predictions, although Zvezda lost some very important games that really hurt them. But after yesterday, they're back in business. Yeah. It's tough. It's tough. Don't ask your predictions. Okay. Do you have? Also, do we all agree on the six? Basconia, you mean? No, I mean, uh, do we all agree on, oh, the, on, on the six teams? I yeah. don't know. I don't agree. I agree on five. So which one do you not agree Ephes. with? FS, you think they might not make it? I think, uh, either, although looking at their remaining schedule, probably changing that. <laughs> I think they'll do look, enough to be at least playing the power ways, with the way, but the, oh, as well right will now. be there. They're playing yeah. as well home, then they're playing Maccabi, Partizan home, Alba away, Milan home, Virtus home, Fenerbahce away, Monaco and Madrid home. A lot of home games, four, five, six, Aswell, seven. No, they're playing away. Aswell away, right. Yeah. This is where you have to start looking at the, at the schedules. I mean, at least a little bit to make the predictions. If yeah. Basconia win today against Jalgiris, which I think they'll do, to me, they're a lock mm -hmm. to, to and playoffs. Then I have Basconia, FS, and then I'm between Partizan and Red Star. Okay, Partizan, Reston, and Maccabi, they will have the same amount of victories, and then it depends on head-to-heads. I believe. So I cannot control that, sorry. <laughs> Not answering This is my question. escape. We didn't even mention Valencia, although they are... They disrespectful are Valencia, they're great. They are in the picture. They were ninth in two years ago as well, so they're kind of underrated Let's competitors. Let's look at their uh, schedule real quick. Pau away. 
Olympiakos, Basconia, away, Milan, Real Madrid, Fener, Monaco, Zvezda, Žalgiris, Virtus, Barcelona. Uh. It's doable. It's hard, but Valencia is also more or less a home team, like, yeah. like Maccabi. Even though they are seven and six at home and five and five away. Damn, five they have five. a tough yeah. schedule, man. Oh, that's that's not bad. I thought, I honestly thought that was different. To me, uh, this is different conversation, guys. Okay, Olympiacos, Real Madrid, Barcelona. Fener is going to make it. Monaco for sure. Basconia six. Partizan seventh. And Anadolu Efes eighth. Oh, so you include Efes right now? Okay. I, I looked at their schedule and I think... Ah, okay. Uh... Rosmin, top three players that you would transfer any EuroLeague player to Lithuanian national team if there are no passport issues with available players. So we will agree <laughs> on Mike James, <laughs> then Keenan Evans. Just can, can we have Lorenzo Brown as well? Nope, he's, no. he's it's it's just he's Spanish man. point guards, ball handlers. Exactly, that scores. You know what? Uh, yesterday uh, we were broadcasting the Lithuanian women's national team, and I've talked with my colleague that in Lithuania, it doesn't even matter, men or women, youth teams, senior teams, it's always the same problem, ball handlers. It's always the problem that when we face these physical teams, we will have a lot of turnovers. So when you need to pick a player that could improve a Lithuanian basketball team, you would always pick a point guard, a ball mm. handler, a combo guard, whatever, but somebody that can actually handle the ball. Even though the situation is getting better, but the damage was done, uh, you know, in, in the, the past, year, in the past, in the yeah. years, in the years before, but you know, the development of players in Lithuania have been, you know, changed a little bit. The, the way, uh, you know, kids have been coached lately, they, they come with much more skill. Uh, you know, they emphasize dribbling, they emphasize footwork much more. And because, and because you know, 20 years ago, 50, 10 years ago, it was much more just, you know, win that game when you were 14 years old. And you have one big guy, you know, in front, you're just yeah, pushing your and you, game if you, through. If, if, you are, uh, if you are uh, 190 and mm. you are 14 years old, uh, you're not going to play with the ball, you're going to set screens and that's, you know, stops your development as a potential uh, tall ball handler, which is now you know, the main topic uh, in basketball. So that's 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 sad that we had to, we are going through this right now for the last 10 years, but we can't really change the past, I guess. Uh, Pure Hain, since you've commented Red Star a lot, a situation with Compass and EuroLeague sanction, do you know that Partizan is under bad sanction at the moment? And how is it possible that no one is asking questions about that? Whether they lie to EuroLeague, that they don't have depths? Uh, Man, things in Serbia is, are just yeah, sensitive. Um, yeah, I checked. Uh, I tried to address those questions, uh, and we all see that officially they had some bad cases with Stefan Jankovic and Nemanja Gordic, their former players. They have won a uh, FIBA band, but I think that the main difference is that these awards uh, came out only a month ago. So basically, it's not like they were in depth. It's, it's it's the same like killer is not sentenced as a killer before, you know, final court decision. So when there's final court decision, mm. you can uh, treat him uh, as a killer. So the same in basketball. Okay, they were uh, they were sued uh, uh, on bats, but until the final decision came, it was not clear if they have depths or not. So mm. now they, they they have to pay those players uh, some amount of money. Uh, Jankovic is getting less. Uh, Gordic is getting a huge amount of money. But the thing is that, and I think that the main difference, I don't, I don't know how it was exactly, particularly with Red Star, because even the Euroleague is not disclosing what happened about hidden stuff that was not declared. But uh, the thing with Partizan is that once the judgment is done and they get the ban, they ask for uh, for installments. Uh, straight away to to start paying those debts so they kind of have debt but they have this agreement uh, to pay the money in installments and it's different it's basically a covered case 
uh, unless you don't uh, follow the agreement and you don't pay after the second or third uh, payment. Uh, so basically, this is it with partisan. That's why their case is mm. uh, different right now. I don't know if they will get any ban from the EuroLeague because now they have this official FIBA ban. Uh, but if they will do all the paperwork uh, properly and the EuroLeague will see that, okay, the pay uh, debts are going to be paid, I mean, it's, I think it's not the case. I just hope one day we won't have to talk about uh, these such kind of things in Europe. Neither uh, in EuroLeague or any other competition. It's a big, big uh, shame of European basketball. Uh Dr. Red, should you really reconsider the position of Alba Berlin? I mean, they're not even competitive. Well, maybe right now they're not. It's not like they're a bad organization. I think it's no normal to have two German teams. German is one of the priority markets for the EuroLeague, so... They're hosting Final Four. They already host it, and they will be hosting in the future. So, I mean... They're somebody, the only somebody has to be bad. I mean, and, and, <laughs> and they're bad also because they have the lowest budget in the Euro League, but they also they probably the best platform from young and up and coming players to get some Euro League experience because young players they're not playing in the Euro League. And they had a lot of injuries. Honestly, I think uh, they they would have a True. better record if if not for those injuries. Um, I think it's fine. We have two German teams. They're different teams. One season Alba will be more competitive, like like last year. This season it just happens to be a bad year for them. I mean, after last season we could say, shouldn't we reconsider Algiers? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I I said somebody has to be bad. I meant somebody has to be last. You know. Yeah. Ah, true. It's, I know. I know. I get it. Like, actually, in, I checked the regular season record from the last three years. So actually, the last team is Panathinaikos. Should we reconsider their position in the Euroleague? I doubt it. I really doubt do it. They have we shouldn't. Good, do they have good organization like Alba? Uh, that's another another topic. No, I'm kidding. Sometimes they do, sometimes yeah. they don't. Yeah. <laughs> then there's uh, Panathinaikos has 28 wins, Asvel has 29, Alba 30, Red Star 33, Jalgir is 37, uh, 37, and then the list goes on. So uh, I'm perfectly fine with Alba Berlin, honestly. And I'm perfectly fine with all teams we have in the EuroLeague at the moment. Right now, we do have mm -hmm. a very good lineup. That's true. In the league. Imagine the EuroLeague had some kind of uh, format. You know, it's a closed league, but we count wins in the last five seasons. And who has the least amount of wins in five seasons are stripped of the license and then a new <laughs> team comes in. That's the only way how you can move in or move out of the EuroLeague. <laughs> Because you, you, if you get in, you have a five-year guarantee that you're going to be in this league, and you know you can attract sponsors. I mean, and in the fifth year, <laughs> GMs would go all in, yeah. knowing that mm -hmm. this is the season where we must overachieve. Yeah, that's how it was before, and teams like Jargis, they were going over their budget actually because they had to win. Bets in three year cycle in yeah. the local league to, to be in the Euro League. counted and like cup that. counted, I think. So oh, it was a big it was rivalry. A it was a mess. It was actually not as aggressive, but a lot of mess like we have in Belgrade right now. With all these owners going at each yeah. other publicly. We had the same with Romano. I remember and that Benauskas. basically the system was so difficult to understand that we had this one season when Neptunas made it to the LKL finals. finals. And then we needed Besiktas ah. to beat somebody and in somebody Turkey and to Valencia in yeah. to do something in Spain so that Neptunas move somewhere in these coefficient standings. So that, that there's a spot in the EuroLeague, And they actually. go to the EuroLeague yeah. mm. and you're sitting there thinking, who am I rooting for? <laughs> what, what needs to happen? Why do these results affect the future of, of this club from Klik? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that was just too mesmerizing, I would say. Neptunas fans just watching a random Turkish league game yeah. <laughs> on a Thursday night. Uh, Danius Rumsha, our colleague, let's say there is a statistic which would measure the impact. Hustle deflections getting on the nerves of opponents, leader of the players with the last amount, with, with the least, least amount of minutes spent on the court. Who would be your pick to be at the top of the EuroLeague? The least amount of minutes. Hmm. I was thinking about Thomas Walkup before the least amount of minutes. Yeah, Walkup has Lorenz plenty, of, plenty, plenty of minutes. Lorenzakis. 
I thought about Branko Lajić. Branko Lajić John for Brown, sure. maybe. Laz- Lazarevic. Lazarevic. Yeah. John Brown plays a lot. Yeah. So Lajić maybe. It's too many minutes. But Lajić also plays 20 minutes. He just, you don't see him on the court for 20 minutes because mm-hmm. on offense he doesn't do much. But on defense he's all, all over you mm-hmm. all the time. Um, We don't have too many impact players. Yamadar. But does he do many deflections? No, and he's the dirty he's, work. No, he's getting getting on the nerves of the point guards. I would say mm-hmm. he's irritating defender. Uh, who else is there? Paris Lee, but you know, also sometimes he's off. I mean, sometimes he's really sometimes he's it, off, but sometimes, but sometimes he off. wins you a game in the third quarter alone against true, Zalgiris. True, true. Just because of you know the other point guard can true, true, can't. true. I, and I loved him in Monaco. I mean, he, mm. he was a great fit. What else do we have? We already have a solid top five, so. Just we don't have that top of the top. Uh, short Virtus question by Marco Zambelli. Hi guys from Bologna. What do you think about Virtus season so far? And do you think we can reach the playoffs? It's a very bad timing to ask about Virtus. <laughs> True. <laughs> Yesterday, <laughs> True. <laughs> the game was unwatchable. I don't know. To me, like they're too old school. In some games, it works for them playing this uh, game of mismatches. But in other games, you're thinking they're too old school. And basically, that's why I don't see them in the top eight. Although with mm. Cariolo's uh, tactics, they break some games, they get some solid wins. Sometimes you're thinking that uh, they are quality. And, and sometimes Milos Teodosic does something very impressive, but I don't think they'll be in the playoffs. And after yesterday's game, it's it's such a bad timing to talk about Virtus, honestly. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you never know. Like I'm, when I when I see Virtus game, I'm like, okay, who, who, what I'm getting t- today? You you never know. Like you know, Maccabi at home, you know what to expect. Virtus doesn't matter where they play, away or at home. You just never know what to expect today. And to me, uh, this consistency has been has been lacking. Uh, it's great that Milos Teodosic turns is turning back the clock because at the start of the season they were lacking a, a ball handler, a playmaker, uh, really badly, and, and their offense was hardly watchable. Yeah. Uh, but lately they are better. It's just that yesterday wasn't the best evening for mm. them. Although I don't think that playing so much post up game in modern basketball works in the long run. It might work in, it's true. in in some games, but in the long run, I think their uh, strategy of just playing through mismatches all the time, posting players from different positions, it's just kind of hard to watch. And maybe for next season, uh, they need true, to but, move but they, the roster. But they're playing this way because, you know... That's what they have. The coach plays yeah. with what he has. Yeah, I agree with that. The coach yeah. plays to the to the strengths of the team. So for sure, yeah, I think they're just still a relatively young organization. Okay, they're a historical name, but the, all the people working behind, uh, they're still young and experienced. Uh, talking about the biggest year league level, and and we're talking about the team which is still only one way away, went away from the top eight. At the same time, they're suffering a lot from those bad contracts that they had to sign to win the Euro Cup three years ago with Belenelli with Teodosic. So uh, as soon as they will have a chance to reshape uh, the roster, more flexibility in summer, uh, we might see a different picture. I believe they're not, they're not far away from making the playoffs this year already and a couple of signings in the yeah. summer would would make them a solid contender yeah. to, to, for the playoffs. And uh, just the last question by Alex Angila. Uh, who had the idea of the basket news? And if you could make one change in the EuroLeague, what it would be? So just to be short, probably the Jonas Miklovas was the main initiator of this basketnews.com project because he was doing, he and his whole team, they were doing a great job in Lithuania. Basket News is the biggest website in Lithuania. And it actually became kind of a cult, especially with the subscribers army. They have over 4,000 
uh, active subscribers. And we just fought traveling all around the EuroLeague uh, since Shurna Sisikai just took over. Both him, me, and some other col colleagues, we traveled all around Europe and we noticed how nobody cares about the EuroLeague. Uh, sometimes we as foreign journalists, we were more active in the practice sessions of the biggest teams of the EuroLeague. And then throughout our experience with World Cups, Eurobaskets, we saw that there's a huge niche that should be filled in Europe, Talk, speaking of mar uh, media uh, platform, which could unite the whole European basketball community because the whole European basketball is split in a lot of local uh, media outlets. And if you're a foreigner or if you want to track as a Lithuanian other teams closely, and if you're a American player or you're a family member, there's basically, unless you have to be great at Google Translator, it's it's really hard to do. So we found this niche. We, we gathered great people around uh, who can make this product great and we're still pushing uh, for it uh, to reach our goals. And yeah, the next part about the about the EuroLeague change, what would you have for this one, one, one thing? Playoff Brad. series, the... the Simple answers. Uh, I want playoff series. I want quarterfinals to final series. Yeah, I want mm -hmm. proper playoffs, not just the quarterfinals. Uh, the final four format has been okay. And when we had this basket news retro, we've agreed that it made the league more fair because the sky was just too powerful. But right now, we're not so sure who's going to make the top eight. We're not sure if the current champions will be in the top eight. So honestly, I, I do believe that in the semifinal and in the final, you would also have great series, best of five. But we have this issue with the schedule, with the national championships. There are too many games played. And if you put even more games on, on the schedule and if you expand the league to, to more teams, you have a problem, obviously. Other than that, I'm not so sure. I wouldn't change anything about the competition format except playing tournament. Except the playing tournament yeah. that the easiest. The tenth Where? spot should give you something. A chance to make it to the postseason. Anything else? No, no, I was about to say the playing tournament. Yeah. You should call a cab already. We're out of time. <laughs> And okay. that's a wrap of our Q and A podcast. Thank you all for all the questions. Sorry for those who we didn't have time to answer, but I believe that we answered uh, most of them. One more time, join basketnews.com slash plus beyond plus members community to have a lot of extra features. And the simplest thing you can do actually just press like button below this video, subscribe our channel. 50% of our viewers, they're not subscribers of our, ch of our channel, which is a crime because not just they're just missing the podcast, but some great <laughs> recaps of games, uh, Augusta's uh, video analysis, some great stories, beyond uh, retro. Uh, project is about to come up uh, this week already because we're I don't think shaming people is gonna work <laughs> yeah you're okay. not gonna attract more let's subscribers check, by check. shaming this people. time we're <laughs> shaming people the next week we will do some some <laughs> other strategies let's see how it works thank you all for supporting us beyond plus members thank you all for watching us um, asking those questions and just uh, being with us uh, together on this ride 